My sermon passage is Psalm 29, page 478 in the Pew Bible. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oaks to whirl and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. <clears throat> Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. It's Trinity, Trinity, Trinity Sunday again. Across the world, preachers are doing one of one, two, three things in expounding on this most perplexing of doctrines of God as three, yet in one. One, some preachers are preaching for the bleachers using every ounce of biblical knowledge and spiritual experience they have in order to rise to the occasion and bring their congregations up with them to soar with them. Two, some are falling to temptation the impulse to employ every bit of theological acumen and philosophical expertise they know, drawing on dictionaries and encyclopedias, historical documents, testimony, charts and graphs, and weird algebra to try to explain the Trinity. And three, some are ignoring it because they just don't know what to do. Well, I didn't know what to do, but I did something anyway. So here's what I did, three things. One, I spent time in reading and reflection, which I usually do. Two, my head exploded, which it honestly usually does not. And so then I tried to put my head back together. And three, I took a nap, which usually comes Sunday afternoon. And I promise you, one will come after a while, <laughs> after church. It usually comes then, not before I've even written a word of a sermon. Well, it turns out that human wonder and honest awe, which can make your head explode, as well as your heart, and make it race, leaving you needing a nap, those are good ways to start thinking about the mystery of the Trinity. But rather than try to soar with high-flying rhetoric or try to explain the Trinity, I thought today, let's just enjoy it. See, after my nap, I hit the hymnals. And singing is a natural response to the glory and mystery of God. Hymns draw us into God's majesty. Come, thou almighty king. Come, thou incarnate word. Come, holy comforter. To thee, great one in three, the highest praises be. Then there's... Come, great God of all the ages. Come, Christ Jesus, flesh and spirit. Come, great spirit, in and with us. Come, O oh come, in celebration. Household of the one true God. One more, and then they'll make three. Sovereign Lord of all creation. Ground of being, life and love. Height and depth beyond description. Only life in you can prove. Jesus Christ the one for others. We, your people, make our prayer. Help us love as sisters, brothers, all whose burdens we can share. Holy Spirit, rushing, burning, wind and flame of Pentecost, fire our hearts afresh with yearning to regain what we have lost. In Hamlet, Shakespeare has the sin-sick murderer Claudius 
say at the end of a prayer left empty for lack of confession. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. And I think words without tune, words of praise to God's glory at least, without music, must, <coughs> must struggle to get there because we can't help but sing, at least in our hearts. That's one reason I picked this psalm again to preach today. All the psalms are songs, but Psalm 29 is on the lectionary for Trinity Sunday for good reason. Psalm 29 is replete with lyrical testimony to the glory and majesty of God, who we understand as Trinity. Glory and strength in verse 1. Glory and holy splendor in verse 2. Glory and thunder in verse 3. Power and majesty in verse 4. And glory, power, and inspiration in verses 5 through 9. And then, just as we mere mortals start to wonder whether we'll be sent back to dust in the face of such power, the psalmist throws us a lifeline, a lifeline for surviving this thundering God, this fiery God thrashing trees, stripping forests, and frightening cattle. We hear and we sing, if we dare, verses 10 and 11. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And with that, this ancient psalm, which predates the church's word, Trinity, by perhaps thousands of years, this psalm gives us important gifts. Three of them. Imagine that. Three gifts to help us enjoy the experience of the Trinity. One, metaphor. Two, relevance. And three, shared experience. First metaphor, we have a thundering storm, lightning, breaking cedars, skipping frightened calves, an earthquake, and maybe even a tornado. And this weekend, this <laughs> passage resonates. You look at some of the, here I go off script, so off script. You look at some of these videos this weekend are astounding. That one out at uh, Olusty and El, El Rada out by uh, Altus, they got more data from that one tornado because it sat for so long in one place and it was surrounded by storm chasers and scientists. And I thought of the glory of God when I see that. See, the glory of God isn't all happy, happy, joy, joy. There's a certain threat that comes to it because God is God and we're not. And so keep that in mind. The glory of God should scare you a little, even though we know God loves us. It says the voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl, strips the forest bare. That's a tornado. And all in his temple, they walk out into the yard to watch like we do. <laughs> and they say, glory which may or may not be what we say when we walk out into the yard to look at a storm. But thank God for metaphor. All language for God, including language in the Bible, is metaphorical. How could it otherwise be for the creator of all time, all space, and all matter? As mere mortals, as mere mortals, we know how challenging it can be to talk about holy God, but we can't help it. We talk about God and hope for the best. God talk is theology. It's hope for the best organized. The late Frederick Bickner, about as devout a Presbyterian as you would have ever found, wrote, and I so love this, theology is the study of God and God's ways. For all we know, Dung beetles may study us and our ways and call it humanology. If so, we would probably be more touched and amused than irritated. One hopes that God feels likewise. And we pray, which is God talk directed at God. What of that? In one of his novels, Bickner, who was a follower of Jesus, has one of the characters, Godric, 
who was an actual medieval saint make a confession. What is prayer? It's shooting shafts into the dark. What mark they strike, if any, who, who's to say? It's the reaching for a hand you cannot touch. You whimper. You load God down with empty praise. You tell him sins that he already knows full well. You seek to change his changeless will. And yet, yet Godric prays the way he breathes, for else his heart would wither in his breast. Prayer is the wind that fills his sail, else waves would dash him on the rocks, or he would drift with witless tides. And sometimes by God's grace, a prayer is heard. Godric was awed and humbled. And just as he prays the way he breathes, we speak of God, <coughs> for we must in metaphors. And sometimes we create new ones, like the word Trinity. We dare speak of God as the Bible writers spoke of God in all kinds of ways. God is shepherd, king, judge, ruler, potter, father, mother, a woman in childbirth. Ken, lover, bridegroom, bear, lion, eagle, rock, a refuge, a brook, wisdom. Now, notice that almost all those metaphors are living creatures, and most are human. And more than that, they're relational. A shepherd has to have a flock. A king has to have subjects. And a judge must have plaintiffs and defendants or appellants. Father, mother, lover, bridegroom, each is defined fully only when seen in relation to the other, with an other. Metaphor gives meaning. Metaphors for God give meaning and show relationship and therefore relevance. Psalm 29 gives meaning and relationship and relevance. In it, in it, God is majestic, God is mighty, God is awesome. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood, verse 10 says, and that means over all, because the psalm writer's understanding of everything, of all creation was this, waters beneath, the dry land that he lived on, and waters above. That was it. So it goes on, the Lord sits enthroned as king forever over all, for always. In awe and humility, we search for words to pray. With the psalm writer, may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Yes, God is majestic. God is mighty. God is awesome. But God above us, God with us, God in us, and God for us. See the connection? See the relevance? It's the relevance of Psalm 29, which demonstrates the relevance of the Trinity. The Trinity is neither a dusty old doctrine nor a static thing somewhere out in deep space. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are in love with one another, deferring to one another, serving one another, and loving, stooping to, and so serving us, enabling us then to love, defer to, and serve one another as a community, as a family, as the body of Christ. God above us, but with us, and inside us and among us. And that makes me want to sing again. And I, I thought, I hesitate to sing this because I'll be honest, this morning I wasn't in the mood to sing. But you know what? When you're not in the mood to sing, sing, and it'll put you in the mood to sing. Isn't that right? Yeah. In the stars, his handiwork I see. On the wind he speaks with majesty, though he ruleth over land and sea. What is that to me? Till by faith I met him face to face, and I felt the wonder of his grace. Then I knew that he was more than just a God who didn't care, that lived away out there. And now he walks beside me day by day. 
Ever watching o'er me lest I stray, helping me to find that narrow way. He's everything to me. That's what all the glory and power and majesty of God is for. In Psalm 29, in, in our own lives. Not to cause storms and tornadoes that break trees and stampede cattle and make the earthquake, but to empty into us. May the Lord give strength to his people, it says. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Strength, but not for violence. Peace, but not peace and quiet. No, for shalom, which is so much more than lack of war, lack of violence, and lack of noise. The promise of God, our experience of the holy, if we take it, our shared experience among ourselves and others, as well as that great cloud of witnesses who came before us, all that is shalom, the very hum of three in one. I see that as the defining feature of God, as audacious as it is for a dung beetle like me to say. Because shalom is the defining feature of my relationship with God, which always come clearest, comes clearest to me in community with y'all. Shalom, wellness, well-being, welfare, favor, wholeness, health, sustaining, affirming, blessing, and as disciples of Jesus, justice seeking, in communion, in conversation, in love, personal, communal, dynamic, and in prayer. So let us pray. O oh God of glory and strength, power and majesty, God of earth, thunder, wind, water, and fire, O oh God, you are our father, mother, creator, our closest relation forever. For you have given us grace by our confession of faith to imagine the glory of your trinity and your unity. Give us strength. Give us peace. Grant us shalom. Keep us faithful, O oh God, who lives and loves with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.